think that's a sentiment we all share. And I feel very enriched today meeting all of you. You missed something great. So yes. Yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do a recap at the end. All of us will present again. <laughs> so, uh, I don't really know how Anthony and I got in touch. We both share the same surname and unfortunately we're not related. But uh, now we are. <laughs> so, uh, I, when I was asked to introduce myself, I introduced myself as a dot connector. I've changed three careers in the course of my life. So, uh, I'm fairly old compared with everybody in this room. But the people I compete with, in, you know, in my profession are really youngsters, huh? they're like half my age or less, which is really wonderful. Okay, so uh, right now I run a lighting design firm, okay, uh, which began as an electrical consultancy firm, which I inherited from my father, and uh, I run it as a partnership with my brother, who is unfortunately not here today. We sit in the same office across the same table. We have uh, very fruitful arguments with each other. And uh, before that, I trained as a as a aircraft mechanic. So I used to service engines that were off wing before they went into flight duty, which is a very interesting pace. It's very stressful, and you do things by the book. Uh, people don't last in that job for very long because at some point you're going to make a mistake, and then you're going to be checked and checked and checked and checked and then you might never do your job again. Hmm? That said, you know, uh, for those of you who are aviation buffs, you know, it is amazing to think that you cannot drive your cars, right, for 40,000 kilometers without expecting something to happen. But the aircraft we used to work on used to fly 18,000 kilometers every day and nothing used to go wrong. So that's, how, that's the difference between that industry and others. Since this was dedicated uh, to women, I thought I'd start showing you one of our very early projects, hmm, which I was introduced to as a feminine project. Hmm. So this is the, uh, this is a, a, a branch of the Aurobindo Ashram, which is dedicated to the mother. This is a feminine building. Uh, it's right here in Ansal's Palam Bihar. And uh, it's feminine because it's intended only for women. It's shaped like an egg. You can vaguely make out the shape. And it's completely buried in the ground, like a seed waiting to sprout. Okay? Where you see that little tree in the front, you know, is an opening and there's a window. So when you're inside the building, you can actually look out at that tree which is glowing. The samadhi in the center is again a feminine, you know, an egg cut in half like that. And just to show how, how bountiful women are in, in, on the face of this earth, the light that's falling on it is, has filled it to the brim and is now overflowing onto the floor. It's, I feel very fortunate because I've worked with interesting people and, you know, they've sort of uh, embraced us uh, and, and that has led to some very interesting collaborations. This was one of them. So, if you look at this building, you don't see any lighting fixtures, you don't see any ceiling fans, right? Uh, but, it's a breathing building. It is cooled with air that is brought out from a subterranean passage and these brown things that you see there are actually louvers through which cool air is drawn into the building. And since that was there, you know, we put a light inside that. And then because, you know, there were these columns that came out from there, right, against which the louvers are standing, we put a light inside that. And then, at every junction where the structure sort of met the ring beam that went around the building, we put another lamp there. So these are just lamps. But it, this was in the time of halogen when you actually got them in different beam angles. Hmm? 
So depending on where you place them and how you place them, you could actually get <coughs> effects like this. And then simply by a simple dimmer, you know, you could actually change the way the building looked and felt. Okay. So, so much for that. I, I, I wasn't going to actually show this building, but I just thought that since we were talking about women and feminism, that this would be a nice place to start from. Who designed it? Sorry. Uh, Sanjay Prakash. You know him? Yes, yes. yes. So Sanjay and I are very old friends. Uh, we, we share a lot of interests and so we've done some of our most interesting work with him. He's speaking on the twelfth. You know that. Ah, I, I didn't, but okay. I'll be there. So, now, okay, so one of the things I've loved doing in, in my work is, you know, not just lighting, it's about looking at things. So I'm like a little kid who goes around and you, you see something on the floor and you say, what is that? And then you see that and you say, what is that? And how can I use these two things? Okay. So I actually feel very often that, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm always living through some sort of a childhood. Ideas excite me. Design excites me. You know, what is this? What is it like to you? Yeah. Two world intersecting two graphs. Yeah, that's right. So this is a great idea, right? And that's the continuum of time. And then there is one point at which everybody catches on and says, hey, that, this is a great idea. So the idea I'm going to talk about over here is, okay, sorry, what is this? Another set of graphs, right? This is the cost of a great idea and how it gradually droops down until it will start working for you. Okay? And this is a typical human lifetime. This is just justifying what I told you earlier. You know that uh, you have this human lifetime, and right in the beginning, you know you're you're a little kid, and you go through this period of structured learning, right? Then you go through a period of slightly more focused learning, which is the yellow. You know, perhaps some of us did this in college, and some of us didn't. <coughs> and then that's the space you have, you know, where you're productive and people listen to you. You can actually reach a position of leadership. And you say, let's do it this way, and everybody nods their heads, right? You're part of a team, or you're a leader, or whatever. After that, you get to a point of mentorship, which is a polite way of saying that, you know, if you haven't really made it, you should go out to pasture, okay? So I just <laughs> curved this thing a little bit, huh? To, uh, I, I, I may have got the positions wrong, I thought most of you would be somewhere there, but it turns out that you guys are somewhere here, and I'm there, okay? <laughs> I'm the white dot that's further down. So I have very little time left. <laughs> Before somebody says, hey, you know what, you're not relevant anymore. So I need to use this time really, really wisely. Uh, what is this? Don't stress yourself about this. <laughs> the idea I'm talking about is solar power. Okay? And that is the imaginary point at which everybody thinks so. I chose this presentation because a few days ago, you know, I watched Elon Musk, who is a big noise now, right? And I said, hey, I thought of that first, okay? He is just a powerful man at taking an idea, very often created by somebody else, but putting it in a domain where it starts working for everybody. No offense. Okay, because that is actually the kind of person that makes a difference to the way the world thinks and feels, right? So, this graph tells you a couple of other things. Okay, it also tells, am I connected on sound through this? Yes. Okay. So, the song is, here comes the sun, right? Okay. As often happens, right? When one great idea happens, okay, lots of other ideas have to be unlearned and discarded, right? And that is actually going to happen. We are on the verge of solar energy and solar systems transforming the way we, we actually live, right? So there are going to be all these ideas that are going to get discarded along the way. Uh, in 2010, this is what was actually calculated. 
that with a total of less than 500,000 square kilometers of solar panels, the power needs of the entire world could be met. Whoa. Right? No, you'll see this if, if you Google uh, Elon Musk on YouTube, you'll actually see this. And he's got this little square in the center of the US, and he says, that's all we need. And it's true. Okay? So I took that calculation. I said, well, this actually solves the energy problem of the world. What's the only threat? The only threat is day and night. You know, you have uh, daytime in some areas and you have nighttime in others. But what if we made this grid, you know, that wrapped itself, which is these two lines that you see there, wrapping itself around the world, okay? And we selected certain places, you know, with optimal sunshine, right? And the green lines are the lines which feed into these grids, right? And the red lines are the load lines by which power is actually distributed. So now, you know, when the US is uh, in darkness, some point in India, which is roughly 180 degrees displaced, is actually feeding it with power. We could actually float these panels on the, on the ocean surfaces. We could use the Sahara Desert. So you see a huge green one sitting over there. And then I actually thought the engineering through this also. Okay? And it's actually workable, you know. If you ask me to put a to put a time frame on it, I'd say like if I thought this thing up in 2010, it should already have happened now, okay. Now I can't put a date to it. I talked about technologies that would fall by the wayside when solar energy actually came in. But look at all the technologies that are already becoming exciting things to play around with. Uh, if in terms of any of kids making career choices, this is where they should be. Hydroelectrolysis, you know, solar power can power your homes and light your tubes and charge your batteries and all that. But how do you, how do you handle locomotion? Well, if you were able to create huge amounts of hydrogen, which you can with electrolysis, and then you had another device, which is a PEM, a proton exchange membrane, you don't have to actually set fire to the hydrogen to turn it into a safe exhaust like water. You simply use a PEM, right? And you can safely bring hydrogen up to a usable temperature and use it to create kinetic energy. Okay? Obviously, to build a bus bar like that around the earth, you need a superconductor. So with superconductors, we need cryogenics, the science of working with very, very low temperatures. Because the solar source will always generate in DC, we will be discarding all our AC motors, right? The ballast that you see in these tubes, this device which is connected to that 230 volt socket to power my computer, all this is going to disappear. You are going to have a solar panel on your terrace and two DC wires running around your house and everything will actually work on DC. Your washing machine motor will become that small. Right now it's about that size because of permanent magnets. What's the threat? The threat is the only thing that can obliterate the sun from our useful lives is nuclear war. Because if that happens, we will have created a dust cloud that is so large that the sun will not be useful to us anymore. So, a few thoughts about the sun. Huh? You could ask for it, it looks like it's free, but can you actually afford it? Because that today, you know, to actually use the sun is a cost in itself, right? So we use best knowledge, best practice. We buy into technologies that match price and performance. And, you know, you blah, blah, blah. So when my kids were studying for their board exams, you know, I had made these beautiful desks for them, which I made with my own hand. I thought, wow, my kids are going to be you know, great students and they will sit at these desks and they will swap their little lives away. And then instead of that, you know, before their board exams, my daughter here is in the 10th and my son was in the 12th at this time. What would they do? They'd get up early in the morning and they'd go out onto this balcony wrapped up in their, you know, winter clothes and they'd be pacing up and down, you know, studying. They wanted to be in sunlight. So, and I thought about, well, what is this thing with sunlight? And because of time, I won't go into it. But everybody knows the 
fantastic thing with the sun. It actually gives life to this planet. Okay? So, in lighting, okay, lots of experiments have been done to try and mimic the way sunlight can work for us in our workspaces, in our living spaces. And, uh, you know, the light sources that you see here are actually a study that was commissioned by Mercedes Benz in, I think, uh, 1987. So these are all fluorescent lamps that you see here. And this, she put this on the circadian cycle, right? No? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the circadian cycle is, uh, okay. So, the circadian cycle is the way your body actually responds to the sun, right? And you wake up in the morning, and because of the prismatic nature of the, of the earth and the atmosphere above it, like the Pink Floyd album, you see this prism and the light bending and breaking up. So the first spectrum that actually hits you is blue. That affects a little gland in the center of your brain, which is called the pineal gland, right? And that suppresses melatonin. I hate using these words, but that is what actually gives you a buzz. It's what happens when you take a coffee, you, you get a caffeine shot. And this is happening just because of the way the sun is pushing its light at you. And in the evening, I mean, you take a little kid and you tell him, paint the sunset. And what is he going to do? He's going to paint orange. The same spectrum is actually reversed. Which is why that yellow light that you see there in that room, or is it just the glass that's tinting it? Possibly yes. No, it's yellow. Okay. You will actually find yourself sitting in your living room in the evening and saying, you know, I want to be comfortable. I want to wrap my arms around the woman I love or enjoy a glass of wine with my friends and you know, enjoy my art collection. You will actually want to do it in that color. And here, this is 4000 Kelvin, okay? We would like to actually sit under a light that is a little closer to real whiteness, okay? And you actually feel a little more alive, okay? And guess what? If I actually took this to an even brighter level, right, you would really have a buzz. It can actually enliven you. So typically, close your eyes and imagine a hospital. What color do you generally see? White. White. Your living room? Candlelight. Romantic, okay? So this is what, uh, you know, some thoughts about how the, the future is actually going to pipe sunlight into your homes. These devices actually exist. They are being used. And I've had the good fortune of actually working on two of them here in India, in which we've actually piped sunlight into buildings. Oh. Okay. Uh, it's easier than you think. Optical fiber. These, are, these use optical fibers. I use the solar tube. Okay. They have a possibility in the building and Oh, yeah. So as I said earlier, there's always this great idea and there's this point where everybody catches on. The next idea I'm going to talk about is a really enabling idea which is coming to everybody knows what LEDs are. And I thought that, you know, it's about time that symbol for a bright idea changed to the technical symbol that we use for an LED. So if any of you are illustrators and you ever do a comic strip and you want to show a bright idea, please start using that symbol. <laughs> So how is this coming to our workplace, right? Uh, studies that continued after what I talked about, the, the original one that was pioneered by the University of Hamburg and Mercedes-Benz, actually showed that when you mess around with these color temperatures, okay, you actually got interesting results. And you can see from that keypad that you read normal, energy, focus, and calm. Okay? So if, for example, I need it a normal color temperature. You can see that this sort of corresponds to where we're sitting, right? This is normal scene. By pushing a button, I could actually push it to a slightly higher level where I would have energy. So if, for example, I was having a debate in a classroom, this is the color temperature I would be looking at. I would like everybody to be alive and responsive and say, what is he saying? Let me challenge that, okay? If I had an exam going, 
and there wasn't interaction, but I needed people to be awake and concentrate, I would go to a 5,500 color temperature. The photographers over here will be particularly interested in this one because at this color temperature, your visual acuity is at its best. You see color best at this temperature. At this temperature, the sun is vertically up there, so there is no prismatic dispersion of light. What you see is what you get. This is what you use in hospitals. No, hospitals would actually be one notch higher. That would be 6,500. Much higher. Yeah. yeah. Okay. More blue. More blue. Uh, this is the calming one. So after you come back from you know a, a PT class or something, and the teacher has to sort of sober the kids down and get them back into focus, you push this button, and that's what should happen. So in our projects, we've actually tried to do this. You know. Uh, we've actually tried to mix color tones and introduce blue light where we needed to keep people together. BPO industry was a new thing that needed this. You know, you were servicing countries that uh, were wide awake while you should have been, sorry, you should have been sleeping. How do you do things like that? So these were contrivances that we actually used to pull this stunt off. Sadly, we never got around to actually measuring our successes, but, uh, you know, in my own office, I actually did this, okay. So I actually have this, uh, you know, we, we, we work late hours sometimes and if my cabin is the one there on the right, if you walked into my office, you know, in the evening when everybody else has gone home, you just see the entire office lit with 22 watts of energy, right? Those are those little pinhole lights that you see there. And there's also a little bit of indirect light. Indirect light is, is a nice thing for those of you who think about design and beauty and things like that. And then I can also make it blue for the times when we are actually working really late, which is also fairly often. But there's one uh, there's one funny thing. Now if you look at this, uh, I hope I'm not boring you with, no, with no, this no, stuff. No. Okay. But it's, it's really interesting because, you know, that curve that you see there, <coughs> That is the sun, right? What I have here is actually a spectrometer. If I were to take this out into the sunlight, right, and uh, I would put it on, so it's actually telling you all the wavelengths of the visible light in this room. Okay, give it a little time. So that. That is the full spectrum of light that we are presently seeing, okay? Uh, take it from me. If I were to take this, so you can see that there is spikes and troughs, spikes and troughs. So this is not really wholesome light, okay? The sun on the other hand, you know, instead of seeing these spikes all over, you see this beautifully even thing with just the right amount of UV in it because, you know, although UV is being touted as harmful, we actually need it in small doses. We also need a certain amount of ultraviolet radiation in small doses, right? Sunshine gives you all of that, okay? But on the other hand, if I were to do the same measurement with an LED, okay? So, You see something really interesting here. Can you see the blue spike? Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. That is because the LED produces all its light in the blue spectrum. And through the chemistry and physics of phosphors, they're able to convert those wavelengths into visible wavelengths. But first of all, that blue tail that you see there, and then again the slightly irregular spectrum that you see in the rest of the wavelengths does not make it a wholesome light for you, okay? So all I'm saying is that, yes, LEDs are really the bright idea, but there is still some distance to travel before it actually becomes useful, right? Okay. So, should I go on to something else or should I? Can I just ask you one quick sure. thing? Why do you say it's not wholesome? Well, uh, as I showed you, you know, it's uh, the, the, all our energies, all our research energies have been focused on building up this 
central spike of yellows and greens. The most visible object on the road in Delhi is an auto rickshaw. The yellow and green are the colors that we see. Look at this table. I mean, look inside that bowl. That is the most visible thing. Those greens and yellows are the most visible. The cover of that book. This, this. Okay? These are things the human eye sees best. Okay? So we'll, we'll just switch tracks completely to, uh, to a little study that, uh, a little presentation that we had to do for students who wanted to know about retail lighting. Okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this should also be interesting because of uh, you know, your own experience with the world of jewelry. And what I was talking about was you know, uh, how, how light can actually uh, help you make this transition from the I need to I want, mm -hmm. right? So, to start, light must illuminate, it must attract, it must enthuse, it must romance, it must reveal, it must conceal, it must mystify. It can do all these things. Trust me, those of you who make movies, those of you who work in design, will not contest a single thing that I've written over there. Pick the word at random and we can argue it out, but it does actually do all those things. It can straighten, it can bend, it can appear, vanish, and create. Create. Okay, we think of creation as the light. Right? That's actually truer than you think, because black holes can bend light, as you know, white sources and the curve of space-time. That is actually light bending. And then, of course, there is Einstein's famous equation, where if you make C the subject of the formula, C being the constant of the speed of light, root E upon M. So everything, all energy and all mass actually derives from the constant of light. So I work in the best industry here. <laughs> <laughs> this is the I need. The way lighting works in the I need environment. Those are your street bazaars, you know, which you'll see in Calcutta and Mumbai and Delhi and everywhere. Uh, so that's the I need. Huh? all the I needs, and these are all the people down there, you know, imagine them as those little white dots on the curve, they're all the I needs, I needs, I needs, I need my butter, I need my potatoes, I need gehu, dal, roti, atta, whatever, 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 right? And that's nice, it's organic, you know, it's fun, but it's small, it's chaotic, it appears disorganized, but actually it isn't. It's all about visibility, giving you choice, comparison, everythingness and nothingness for everyoneness. But it doesn't work for the kind of savvy retailer that you know you work for and I work for and I hope everybody gets to work for at some point of time. <laughs> uh, these guys, you know, are actually looking at those faces down at the bottom of the graph and they're saying, you know, to, to use my favorite graphic method, let's take this whole janta, you know and pray that they come up to this point where they buy yachts and they run a big business, they fly business class and they wear brightlings and Rolexes and they drive Bentleys because then they'll be able to buy my product. <laughs> so, uh, another soundtrack here, which is very appropriate. Oh, sorry. I love the things I never... I want to be a billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> want to be on the cover. Okay, so we let that pass. So, what these guys are always praying that happens is that you know somebody finds a rarefied atmosphere on top, and then somebody else joins in there, and then somebody else joins in there, and then slowly, 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 a whole lot of people reach this point where they are now in the category of I want. They can afford the I wants that we love to sell. And then it's not just about a simple bike or a simple car or a simple timepiece or a simple pair of shoes. It's about a Jimmy Choo, it's about a BMW, it's about a Bentley. Okay. And now, all these things, as Anthony will no doubt share with us in his wisdom at some point, all these things start mattering. How visible should you be? How subtle should you be? You know, where do you draw these little balances that make people think that they're part of this exclusive club? So here, some retail shops, nothing. You know, big brands, but ordinary. Everybody knows that, you know, that's a symbol that speaks for itself. Huh? 
Now these guys, you know, Prada, they are playing in this league, you know. When you look at their displays, you see only three products there that are actually Prada. The rest of it is all contrabands. It's about in the world of Prada, if you had this, 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 then you would be eligible for this. Okay? And I then ran into a client who is actually a jeweler, right? And, uh, I, I, you know, so part of this whole thing is also, sorry, I'll just step back a little bit. It's also about art. You know, people people spend huge amounts of art. I was going to ask you this question. You know, we talked about making charges, right? The intrinsic value of a jewel is that much for the stone, that much for the weight of gold. How much for the design? In the pie chart that you would draw of its value, how much would actually be attributed to design? Not a lot in India. Not a lot Not in India. 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 But I saw India. some pictures of stuff that Garad had or Bulgari had, and then everything gets changed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's no longer tangible. Mm -hmm. Avrupa, Avrupa is changed. Avrupa is changed. Not so much. Not, not much. much. Not, not, not that level. No. Uh, Nirad Modi is doing Nira Modi, Nira, yeah. Nira Nira Modi changed yeah. it. Yeah. He followed like Kathiyas so. of the world. Mm -hmm. and so, uh, I discovered that by lighting art in a certain way, I could actually dramatize it a little bit and make it more viable. Mm -hmm. And I also created a little business niche for myself in which people would say, well, you know, Mr. Lopez, we bought this thing, but it's not looking so nice in my home. <laughs> so would you just come and light it for us? And that was a good thing too. So these are some examples of you know, what we did with uh, a little bit of peeking to light art in an interesting way. We've done lots of gallery projects. Okay, we still do museums, shows. Da, 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 da. This is an interesting project. I don't know if any of you have actually sh shown here. This is Abhay Mascara's uh, gallery in Mumbai. Yes. Anybody? Yes. So what we did over here was we put these. It's a huge. It's, it's a 70 meter high uh, warehouse. Warehouse. Yeah, it was a, co a cotton warehouse. And then he wanted to use this space to show big things, you know, huge inflatable sculptures. So to keep that volume uh, intact, we rigged up this system which was on a, it's a 38 meter long gantry which can actually be winched up and folded into the roof so that you could light or project or hang sound from anywhere. And he uses it. You can see there, you can see the gantry folded up, half of it against the ceiling, and these huge sculptures in the middle. For these, you can see a bear standing down there, tiny little guy. That's these are 25 foot tall uh, uh, inflatable sculptures by Max Streicher. And there you can see performance art with you know they folded up and only the arena lighting is on. <coughs> and you can do all sorts of interesting things once you have proven. This is a technique called depixelation where you know, we can take, uh, before we did this actually, before 3D mapping became popular, where you could actually take the projector and just darken some of the pixels and then you could make it look like an object was floating in the middle of nothing, huh? simply by, sorry, simply by just uh, making the rest of the area black. Okay. More art, more art values. Some of Jodha's photography. Okay, this is 5,500 by the way, this is for, uh, for, a, for a gallery that only shows photography, photoing, if any of you are familiar with that. So this is Gertrude Steidel's work and it's deliberately been shown in 5,500 Kelvin. Now this is another interesting story of retail. So now this is the this is the era or the or the zone in which retail is about an experience, right? So this guy is a jeweler in, in, in Jaipur, his name is Arun Dadda. Do any of you know him? Arun Dadda. Dadda, yes. Arun so he is this is one of those secretive jewelry families which I think they, they're secretive because they often get kidnapped and they pay big ransoms to, to, to get themselves released. Huh? And then they don't tell anybody about it. They just maintain a very, very low key. So this guy decided to build a museum, okay? And what he does is he leads his uh, vulnerable customers through the museum first, okay? And when they're suitably awed, 
he then takes them into his private office and shows them the precious jewelry that he makes. Okay. So at the time you have marriageable daughters, you know, this is the experience you'll be led through. And it's this is really about how premium prices can actually be extorted, right? So he created this because his grandfather was a pawnbroker and as the royal families in uh, in India were going bankrupt, they would send one trusted family retainer, bhai ye tera talwar leke bech dena, you know, or gehanas or, uh, you know, the clothes they wore. And they would quietly come back with some money. And this guy had this huge collection. So I worked with a French designer on this and uh, he was a very irascible guy. Hmm? And he would say, I want very high tech. Uh, have you seen Lucy de la Gimé in Paris? And I said, no. And he said, oh, I must show you and on his app. He would start showing me. And I said, okay. So this is what he did. You enter this pristine white space, and there's nothing but this Jay uh, Ganesh over there. There is no branding and no text anywhere. Okay? It's white, 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 white. That says Gyan. That's the only visible branding. Okay? And then you're led up this white staircase into this white room and then this door opens and we have this little button inside there which you can see there the top the top one reads showtime <laughs> okay so the pretty lady who will take you and says sir please and she'll open the door and then she'll hit showtime and the lights you know, they come up and you see the whole place right inside now, actually, my friend Pramod, who introduced me to this project, and I think whom some of you know, actually said, well, you know, the stuff isn't really all that valuable. <laughs> it's just that the way he's shown it, <laughs> right? So you take this plastic cup, and you build that armored glass vitrine, and you put it inside, and you put a light on it, and then you say, wow! <laughs> that is what he's done, okay? Anyway, some of them, some of this stuff is actually worth conserving. So you can see that we've tried to prove that you know we're taking care of issues like UV and heat, and also the same instrument which you see there is actually being used to determine this. And he's curated it so beautifully. So you know, you're pointing at where's this lab? At the Sitapura, uh, the, the jewelry industrial area. So he has three plants there. This is in one of them. Okay. Okay. And. So you know, he's got these display cases all pointing into the center of the room to this bridal dolly. So you know, see, this is about people spend all this money when their daughters are getting married. So it's all about shadi and having a good time. So all the you know the headgear, the footwear, the tableware, the garment accessories are all arranged radially pointing to this beautiful bridal dolly which is in the center. Huh? And at one point you enter what he calls his library. And again, you know, in all, in all these little rooms, there'll be one little button which says showtime and standby. <laughs> <laughs> so right now it says standby. Okay. You go inside, and to show that this is the library, there are no signboards, but there is a collection of spectacles. Okay, those are all spectacles inside there. And you can see that even, I'm told this piece, these colored glasses are 160 years old. Okay, so even then people, you know, vain enough to want to wear dark glasses in the, in the sunshine. And all the lights are pointing into the room. You know, this is not about lighting technically correctly. This is about creating a little bit of feel. So you can see that all the lighting nozzles are going there, going there, going there, right? And then when you, oh, so there you can see the uh, close-up of the tinted glasses, right? And then, they point inside this room and there are all these 400 year old and 600 year old gem manuscripts kept on this table and you bung your showtime button and the lights go down and then you are in this complete darkness and all you see is the display on the table and those eyes pointing into the room. And the picture of Gyan Chanji there in the corner which is really a halo of light around him. But this is the drawing that we made to show you the toilet. <laughs> so, again, you see, there's no sign anywhere, right? So, uh, you actually enter the toilet through this yin yang corridor. This is the bathroom here. And, uh, you, you know, just imagine that you're going around with this pretty young lady and she says, oh, you know, I need to use the loo. And she says, sir, in there. And it's pitch dark, okay? <laughs> of course, when you walk in there, this sensor will trigger your presence. And all you will see is this 16th century ablution 
vessel. Okay, just barely lit, right? And that's the that's the yin yang door you just entered from. And you know you're literally like groping in darkness. <laughs> okay, where's the loop? And all we have done is light the handle of the door. That's only the handle. Door. So you enter. It's pitch dark. A little bit of light coming from there. The ablution vessel that you steer around, and then you, oh, that must be the door handle. Okay? <laughs> and you go inside into the room, and this doesn't have any light fixtures at all because the ceiling and the walls are made out of thin marble. So it's actually daylight coming in. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And in the night, instead of adding lights inside, we simply light the marble from outside. Okay. So you get the same feeling. <coughs> See. And everything is grafted. I mean, this is a handmade wash basin here. Yeah. Nothing but the best if you're spending this kind of money. Mm -hmm. yeah. So these are those vitrines I told you about. You know, each one is lit. I, I couldn't photograph the jewelry because apparently this is, you know, it's uh, it's these are his designs and or their designs which are owned by you know the, the big uh, retailers. So he said, "Jab tum photo le rahe ho na, main sari ye jewelry ko nikal deta hu." So I said, Chalo, tita, I'm, I'm interested in the lighting part of it. So he actually removed all the beautiful pieces, and, but you still see some odd things there. <laughs> and as I said, it's really all about giving each thing its little pride mm -hmm. of place. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's what he's doing. Time pieces. Sunlight. And then you come to this place, which is the Mushara. So this is all the objects of pleasure. He has what I'm told is the largest hookah mouthpiece collection in the world. Okay, so that's what you actually see there. You know, silver, platinum, gold, and whatnot, and then the rose water sprinklers and the crucibles, which you know, which which spread fragrances and all everywhere. Uh, the the lighting for those of you who are interested. Actually, this is a fixture that we have designed in our office. The light is actually coming from there. What you see happening in those showcases that is actually coming down from the ceiling in that little uh, optically very interesting fitting. That's what it does. Okay. So, for example, we use interesting little tricks here. That is a jade bowl, huh? and when you empty it out, there's an inscription from the Quran, huh? which you see against the light, and it says that you know the last drop or whatever is because of the bounty of Allah. So to show that it was transparent, we simply put a mirror underneath it, and the same light which is you know shining from the top actually lights it from the bottom, and you have light coming through, and you can actually, I don't think you can see the inscription though. Then he has this collection of Kanga, Mughal, and Rajput miniatures, and he said, you know, Lai, the same French man, I'm going to mount these on glass, and I had to light it without any glare or any troublesome reflection coming. Yeah. But you can see that we actually did. It's four layers of glass, you know, like a W peat. And there's one painting on this side and one painting on this side, sandwiched between these two layers of glass. And they're all individually lit, and you can't see a single reflection. You can see the sources of light up there, the little pinpricks in the ceiling. That's it. See, one layer behind another, and those are the lights there at the ceiling. <coughs> this is his office. You are finally brought here, and uh, then again there's a show time, okay, which is under <laughs> his desk, and you sit down, and these are the, you know, they're all bare, the little busts are all bare now, but, uh, you know, when, you can see that there are two lamps on top of each. And what we do for jewelry is, you know, that we actually use a combination of amber and white, and we seesaw the balance between them. If you're showing gold or if you're showing white metal like platinum or silver, you actually mess around a little bit. And he can do that all from under his table. Okay. So that's his office. And then, uh, you know, you can see there, like that's yellow, and the top one is white at this time. Huh? Then you're brought into this room which is very, very neutral and very subdued, but it's incredibly bright. When he actually, when your family is sitting down on that table, that sofa, 
and all these fancy teas which I'm told cost over you know 15,000 rupees a kilo are served to you and all. Most of these people probably don't drink alcohol anyway. Uh, then you're shown these priceless pieces of jewelry, huh? And the girl may be, you know, ask bitte isko tum pehen ke, no? Dekhao. So she goes and she stands uh, in front of this mirror. Okay. And the way we designed this lighting is that, you know, you can see yourself really nicely in the mirror, but everybody else in the room can also see you. Okay. So I tried it out. 